All right. And everybody, and thanks for taking the time to listen into this webinar. And uh, as Blake mentioned, we're going to talk about uh, strategic talent mobility, especially what we do here. So give you kind of the practical applications of what we do here at the American Heart Association. Um, just a little history about me. I've been with the American Heart Association for almost three years at the end of September. It will be three years, but I've got about 25 years of recruiting and HR experience with the last 15 years focused in on uh, recruiting and talent acquisition, talent management. And uh, so uh, my expertise is coming in, building teams uh, and uh, really building those true partnerships. And you know, today and what we're going to talk about is, you know, when you look at your internal hires, you're going to, you, most of you probably, when you run your reports each month or each quarter, you see that uh, you know internal hires are generally in the top three of your source of hire. With us, it's always number one. And so I kind of just want to share some of uh, our successes and what we've been able to do. And uh, certainly, you know, as Blake mentioned, I'm one of those that likes to have a fairly, um, as much as we can, uh, interactive uh, session uh, through webinars. So um, you know, Blake, anytime, just chime in with questions and I'll be happy to answer. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so the takeaways from today, we're going to learn why talent mobility is important at the American Heart Association, um, how we've really made internal mobility a key focus, um, because it's important. Uh, it's a key to, as you'll know, it's the key to retention and many other things. Um, so we'll talk about that. Um, we'll look at what the American Heart Association has in place today. And, you know, I think no one can always, you know, you always read about these articles, how it all went swimmingly. It doesn't all go swimmingly, and we all know that. So there's bumps in the road we experience, and I want to share some of those bumps. And then, you know, where we want to go with uh, with talent mobility um, for the future for, for AHA. Of course, you see that hashtag down at the bottom, the AHA Life. We ask that uh, when you have time, follow it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, and uh, follow, get a little insight into the HA culture, kind of see how we do it socially, but that's for another webinar. So let's, let's, let's define talent mobility, because a lot of people think of it as just internal moves. And, and it is. It's really about looking at your, your, the, the organization that you're responsible for in terms of recruiting, and then having that ability to ramp up and move people from role to role and function to business you know, function to a different function, whether it be a lateral transfer or an internal promotion, um, as the business needs change. And so we take that very importantly here, or take it pretty pretty personally here, and, you know, especially around the internal candidate experience, um, you know, are the positions the right fit for uh, our candidates when they're making that right move? And so we'll talk a little more in detail uh, about how we handle that here momentarily. So. Obviously, in any organization, you are trying to match the organization's needs with the individual's need to grow. And we all have employees that leave because, you know, because they, they found a better opportunity. They have their own aspirations. They have the capabilities. And sure, if we want to play the point the finger game and say, well, you know, if people leave people, yeah. But also, if the people aren't getting that attention from their managers, um, in terms of aspirations and capabilities, they're they're going to go look for a place that that does that, and um, and then you have on the other side obviously the organizational needs, so the experiences that the, that those who we hire come into the organization with, and bring new experiences to the table, um, because that can be looked at as a downside of only focusing on internal mobility. Um, that's not the case. I mean, you you have a good mix, and you certainly lure people in. With the uh, with a strong internal mobility program, you look at their skills and you look at the competencies that they bring to the table, and obviously where the arrow points, that's the sweet spot. Those are where you want the the two to connect in the Venn diagram, right? So that the um, so that the employees feel like, hey, I'm I'm able to grow here, and I'm sharing new experiences. I'm bringing my skills to the position I'm currently in and for future growth. So you've got to be able to find that sweet spot in the middle and balance it. And it's a lot easier said than done. I know that we've experienced it. I've experienced it at other organizations. 
and you know when the people who don't end up getting the positions um, uh, you know they, they may get frustrated but then you there are ways to, which we'll share that you have to say hey you know it's okay you've showed that interest here's how we're going to here's how we're going to help you get that next time the position opens hey Michael quick question yeah. for you yeah. um, someone asked if it's possible at some point can you talk about if when or how your efforts with respect to federal contract contractor positions sure uh, well, well, let's go with that. Um, so we are a federal contractor. Um, so I don't know if that was a staged question, but maybe people know that I'm a, a federal contractor. AHA does business with the government. Um, uh, and AHA is American Heart Association, so sorry for the abbreviation. Um, but we do post uh, uh, most of our positions with the exception of if it's a, a, a promotion within the same business line in the same location. And then, um, if it's uh, you know because of a downsizing or a restructure, the person loses the position. We may not we may just move that person into that role. Um, but I would say 98 and a half, 99 percent of our positions are posted internally um, to show equal opportunity uh, for um, you know for our internal candidates. We do post internally and externally at the same time, unless a manager comes. To us and says we only want to post internally. Um, there are a lot of organizations that will leave the position uh, open internally for two weeks and then nobody applies and then it goes three and four weeks and nobody applies. Um, you've lost your time to fill there if you have to go external. So the best uh, the best method that's always worked for, for me at the last three organizations I've worked for is to post the positions internally and externally at the same time unless you know you only want to go internal. Um, and you know, we have a lot of our fundraising positions, especially as they move up into the leadership roles, are filled uh, internally when they once they move into that director level, senior director, uh, and then obviously vice president and above um, at our affiliate or regional office uh, locations across the United States. So I hope that answers. I hope that answers that question. So. Let's talk about why talent mobility is important, um, and I think a lot of us already know that it's it's the number one source of hire for most organizations. Even looking at Career Crossroads study from last year, it was listed as one of the top as the top source of hires for most organizations. Um, to me, everyone wants to grow, no matter what what type of generational stereotype we put it in. That you know, everyone's talking about the millennials or the Generation Y or Generation X, baby boomers. Everyone wants to grow, so it's not it's not just we shouldn't just say oh well that's just them wanting to make a move right away. Everybody wants to be promoted within an organization. There's no better feeling than making a move in an organization to contribute to different parts of it. So don't look at it as a generational stereotype. Obviously, quicker ramp up in productivity if the person knows the organization. Uh, you know, inside and out. And so when they move from one department or one position to another position or department, there's going to be quicker ramp up because they already understand the culture. From an employer brand perspective, it's great public relations. The word gets out. Um, we don't, uh, one of the things that we're going to start looking at is really publicizing and congratulating, you know, person X and person Y. For, you know, on their promotions on our social media sites. When people see that, people want to work for an organization where they know they can get in. We got over 100,000 people each year applying to our positions, and about 1,300 make it into the organization a year. So when they, um, when they get into the organization, they're going to brag about their promotions. They're going to post that out there. It's going to be on the Glassdoor reviews. That um, you know about the promotional opportunities and about the uh, the overall um, excitement that's built around someone that's you know being transferred for good reasons and being promoted for great reasons. And obviously, employers are viewed as your greatest corporate asset. So once they're in, we look at it as history. They have history with the organization, uh, whether they're six months with the company, a year with the company, 15 years with the company, 35 years with the company. Employees are viewed as your greatest corporate asset. They have all the informational knowledge you need, and 
when you move them from one group to another group, you may you as a department may be losing that knowledge, but another but but that person's still there. They're still reachable. They're still a part of the organization, and you can still continue to go to them for the receiving or uh, the receiving department. The employees are are getting that history and they're trying new things. So there's a lot more reasons as to why talent mobility is considered so important to organizations. But uh, when I look at these five, these really stand out. So let's let's look at the talent mobility at the AHA. So these are our top three um, sources of hire for the last three years. So as you can see, the notation is you know, pulled from Open Hire, which is our ATS. Uh, from July 1st, 2013 through June 30, 2016. Total applications, 327,661 applicants, 4,126 hires over that three-year period. And you look at things like uh, employer referrals, pardon the typo, there's 8,800 applicants, 739 hires. That's 2.7% percent of applicants. 20% of our hires. Indeed, look at that number, 198,707. But 725 hires came from that, or 60% of the applicants came from that source of, that particular source of hire, but only 20% were hired. When you look at the internal, it's the lowest number. It comes in at 4,700 and change. We've hired 1,478, 79 people which is 1.6% of our sources, but 36% of the hires. So we're making things happen over three years, and that's why people are staying. So when you look at our average tenure, it's roughly about eight years. We have people that, um, that, that uh, if they can get through, especially on the fundraisers, if they can get through um, the, the, the first year because it is a major culture shift for them, uh, we're doing really well. Uh, when they get to three to five years, the goal is to you know, have them move because what we found last year is that they are making some moves um, after three years. And so some of the key things there are finding opportunities for them. And so obviously, which we'll talk about uh, shortly, are succession things that we have um, you know, in the works. Um, not only do we look at internal hires, but we look at diversity internal hires and the diversity success um, as a federal contractor. All right. So why is there a focus so for, at AHA? Well, first, it creates a culture that people want to be a part of and experience. They want to improve the retention of fundraiser turnover with less than three years, as I mentioned. You know, we're on a goal, we're on a mission to save lives. And we want to retain those who believe in that mission that gets us to our to our 2020 goal faster. Our 2020 goal is 20%, you know, to improve the lives of individuals, the health or the the, the health of individuals, and uh, uh, by 20%, reduce the amount of cardiovascular incidences and cardiovascular incidences and stroke by 20%. Um, so those the more we keep, the less turnover there is. There's more money to be sought after and raised and they understand how we do it. They don't have to retrain and there's not a ramp up period. Um, the other focus is you have to overcome the, the, the work for nonprofit reputation. So what do I mean by that? You know, a lot of people think nonprofit is slow moving, very bureaucratic, um, uh, you know, it's very much all about the, the, the red tape. It doesn't have leading technology and I'm here to dispute that. Um, I've worked for quite a few organizations, and well, yeah, the bureaucracy is is here. Um, there's no doubt about it. It's everywhere in any organization, for profit or nonprofit. Um, but we have some of the leading technology. We run on top-notch computers. We have some of the fastest servers out there. We have uh, incredibly uh, savvy, creative, te technologically savvy people, um, and so. And we move pretty fast, but we work long hours. And that's a part of the culture of the organizations. We do put in a lot of hours because we believe that we're saving lives by working those hours. And then the other thing that we do is we want to share success stories with our volunteers, our donors, and our social followers. And what better topic to focus on than talent mobility and promotional opportunities and how people move in our organization and their success stories 
and those are going to be a big focus for us in this fiscal year, which runs from July 1st to June 30th of next year. So let's look at the how. So obviously, and this is, you all probably all know this, you have to have a defined process around internal transfers and promotions. You have to respond to the employee engagement issues around their growth. You have to have a top, a top of mind approach toward potential internal candidates. So what I mean by that is they need to be, you as recruiters always need to be saying, hey, what about so-and-so? You need to know the people. Once they get in the organization, especially the superstars, you need to keep a separate list or some type of file where you house your superstars, where your managers are coming back once you follow up with them, if you follow up with them, and if you don't, you should. Just to follow up with your hiring managers going, hey, how's so-and-so doing? They go, my gosh, this is a godsend. Thank you so much. This is the best candidate I've hired. You want to mark that somewhere because when another position opened up, you know, a year or two down the road, you want to be able to tell the, the a different hiring manager, hey, what about so-and-so? And, yeah, you're yes, that is internal poaching, but we do it with an open mindset here. Everybody knows that we want people to continue to move up. We don't deny anybody uh, the opportunity to move up unless – there's a hiccup on their file, like a corrective action, or they haven't been in the role long enough, which is generally up to a year uh, for exempt level positions and at least six months in non-exempt positions. You want to be able to communicate the opportunities, and then obviously you want to measure. And so I'm going to kind of walk through how we do that uh, at, at, the, uh, at the AHA. So let's look at our process. So first and foremost, we speak with as part of our OFCCP uh, process, we look at all internals first. So when we go to start reviewing resumes, we look at our internals and we can sort our ATS by source and it pulls up. We look for uh, the internal tag uh, that's in open hire and we talk with all ex internals before speaking with externals. Like I said, we open up both at the same time, but we're looking for internals first. The talent acquisition team talks to all internals who apply, and hiring managers will speak with all internals who apply. If they're qualified, obviously they're going to take them through the process. If they're not qualified, we're going to have them uh, set up meetings where they sit down with those internals and say, hey, probably not a good fit for this role, but next time the position op opens, here's what you need to learn. Here's what you can do. Here's where you can work to improve on those skills. Here's the kind of knowledge I'm looking for. You know, let me know how I can help you get versed in that. So it's a very uh, proactive and forward-thinking um, uh, methodology around helping those internals. So when we look at our process, we speak to them first. We make sure that we talk to them. And we make sure our hiring managers know that they've applied. Next, let's look at employee engagement. So we take the pulse of our organization every year, whether it's through great places to work, um, which uh, we uh, were definitely recognized as uh, uh, one of the top places to work in healthcare for millennials uh, and for baby boomers. Um, but we also were a great place to work certified for 2016 based on our ratings. Um, we also do other surveys uh, that uh, take the pulse of the organization so that we know how to address issues. So if uh, one of the reasons we have been able to increase the number of internals that uh, apply each year is because they didn't feel like they had enough growth and development. So each department focuses on how to develop their team's growth. If they want to learn, let's say if they're a recruiter and they want to become more versed in sourcing, we're going to give them the opportunity to do so. Um, if they want to, um, if they want to move into a, uh, someone wants to move from a, uh, a non-manager role into a supervisor or manager role, we're going to get them the skills, uh, whether it be through our uh, our learning management system or through actual face-to-face -face training that we teach here on, uh, uh, you know, at AHA. Or if they need to go external, we'll get them that growth because we firmly believe that employees are going to stay if you take care of them. And then obviously our performance discussions are always focused on employee growth during our performance management. And we do um, mid-year and full-year uh, performance reviews. And each one of those discussions 
there's something about our how do you feel like you're progressing? What do I, you know, here's where I think you're going well, here's where I think you need to improve. What are some of your goals? Where have your goals, your goals were this last year, what are your goals this year, and how can I help you develop? And so when you have those types of performance discussions, it's more of a true discussion about their growth, and the focus is on them, not just about a performance rating of a one, two, three, or four, or five, or whatever your rating goes up to. It really should be about them. As I mentioned, you, recruiters need to think first about the internals. You need to get to people. You need to get to know the people that you hire. If you're not doing that today, um, then they're just you're just seeing them as a person. You're filling a button seat. There's not a day that goes by that I walk down the hall, someone says, "Hey, Michael, how you doing?" And I, you know, I respond, "Hey, so and so," and how are things going? And I stop in the hall and I talk to them and I ask them how things are going and I. Ask them, you know, what's going right, what's going wrong, because I want to be able to have coaching sessions with the hiring managers if something does come up that they say, well, I've got issues with that person that maybe I saw in the hall. Well, here's what they thought the job was, and here's what um, here's what they're actually seeing. So by creating those conversations and getting to know the people you hire, um, you know, like I said, you can then put them in your hip pocket or put them into a file and have them at the ready. Uh, the next time an opportunity comes about, you know, if they're that they're qualified for, and if they're ready to make that move, help the help the manager think about the, you know, if we hire, what and where could they grow? So if we hire person X over person Y, not just looking at their hire for right now and for what we currently need them to do, but what. What and where could they grow? What are the skills that they could bring to the team that we don't have now and for the future? So, but you, a lot of recruiters, again, aren't brought into those conversations um, or don't think to have those conversations and you really need to. Um, no matter what the level, recruiters keep internal candidates at all levels at top of mind. And, they may, and we make suggestions before the posting goes up. So while we're having what we call our partnership conversation or our stakeholder conversation, whatever you, whatever you may call it, and you say, well, what about so-and-so? And what about this person? They may be good candidates. They have these skills. Why? Because I did the research and took the time coming to the conversation with candidates that they're ready that are internally ready to go. And again, that's being a good partner to your um, you know, to your to your uh, to your hiring managers. I'll pause here. Any any questions that you're getting, Blake? No, we're good right now. All right, perfect. So succession plans. So basically, um, all regional offices and national center, which is our corporate headquarters, has succession plans for the director and above. Um, 2018, we'll start to focus on managers and above, and then beyond that, I don't know when, but we will start focusing on all levels. And the recruiters utilize our succession plans, you know, in our in our uh, HCM, our Human Capital Management System, which is now Workday. Um, it ensures that that we're keeping these high potential employees top of mind throughout their AHA life cycle. And so, uh, I'm going to go and I'll look at the succession plans and they're made available to all recruiters so I can see you know people that may be ready for the next for a VP role um, or director role at a certain what we call affiliate office or the regional office and we may have a position here that they actually may be right for so what I will do is I'll have the hiring manager go and initiate the conversation we're not really allowed to go out and initiate those conversations because then that's seen as internal poaching, so we want to kind of back away from that. Um, but um, if you're not utilizing your succession plans, whether you have it in an HEM system, an Excel work, worksheet, those should be that should be one of the go-to places, especially for your higher-level positions. Is go to your succession plans, talk with your managers. Um, if they're in the ready status, ready now status, then definitely they should be brought to top of mind and conversations should be happening between the hiring managers and the candidates. Um, if 
they're a year Michael? ready. Yep. We have a question. Yep. So someone asked, uh, when is it necessary to go outside the organization to fill a position instead of going with an internal candidate? So we will, we generally, like I said, we post them at the same time. So we'll look at the internals first. But we're also looking looking at externals at the same time we're looking at internals. It's just when we're reviewing the candidates and then dispositioning them, we're reviewing them by the first by whether they're internal or not. Secondly, to the if they're external by the date that they apply. So generally, it's at the same time. We don't wait a certain period of time and only present internals. We tell internal candidates that they can apply at any point uh, as long as the position is open. Now, if the position has been open six weeks and I get an internal candidate, um, I'll let that internal candidate know that we're fairly far down the road, but I'll certainly uh, present the information to the hiring manager and we'll obtain feedback you know, for them to talk. But generally, if they're pretty far down the road in terms of, hey, I'm ready to, I'm moving either to final interview or I'm about to make a hire, that candidate won't be considered because they've applied too late. And I'll talk about how we get notifications out in a moment. Does that answer the question? Yeah, perfect. All right, thanks. All right, so so like I was saying, you want to keep you, you want to look at those succession plans. Now, if we have a succession plan candidate in mind, we are going to post that position, um, which I'm sure is somebody would have a question about that. So it's a matter of taking uh, that internal candidate and just having them apply formally for the position. All right, so how do we communicate the opportunities? Uh, in fact, we're just getting ready to roll this out, uh, which is a biweekly newsletter that has the following um, information. Um, and we send it out through, it comes from our careers, uh, careers at heart.org uh, email account, um, because rather than come from me, then we're getting general questions, and we have a career advancement advice, which we'll talk about in a moment. We want those questions to come in from uh, into that account. So we have that directed through a very generic account um, that is followed by all the recruiters. Um, but we, we highlight jobs. Uh, we highlight eight jobs. Uh, and so we've got our eight jobs that we're about to highlight. Um, we have over 179 openings, um, but in order to prevent you know, someone from scrolling and scrolling and scrolling down, we said we all agreed that, you know, each group would post one job every two weeks that they really could use some help on, that they really want an internal candidate for, not just any position, but someone where the manager said, I really prefer someone internal for this. And so this goes out to everyone around the country. There's a direct link to our internal careers portal that takes them to, um, to all of our openings so they can view all opportunities if none of the eight featured positions are uh, something that they're interested in or qualified for. We'll talk about recruiting events. So internal events, we're getting ready to do a, a career development or an internal internal job fair, if you will, uh, at the, toward the end of August um, that we're piloting here at our corporate office where they will get to meet the other departments and business lines that exist here at our national office and at our national uh, engagement center, which is in Richardson, which is a suburb of Dallas. And so basically, um, we'll, we're, that's going to be on there. And then external events, we do a Twitter chat on the first Wednesday of every month and um, at, at 6 p.m. Central uh, on the uh, at AHA Life um, uh, Twitter Twitter feed and so we'll post those types of events when we have job fairs or career fairs um, those will be listed as well their locations uh, times uh, and then you know who you know any reason why they, they you know internal employees should attend we provide career advancement advice we have what's called ask the career coach and it'll be things like resume tips or preparing for an interview or how to improve your LinkedIn profile. And we give them, them being the internal employees, the opportunity to ask questions directly to the career coach, which like I said, comes in to the careers at heart.org. And so we'll feature those questions 
in our newsletter because if one person's asking, then I'm sure other people are asking. So I think this, the one that's going to go out today is going to be around a resume. Um, uh, you know, how do you prepare an internal? You know, if I'm applying internally for a job, should my resume? How should my resume look? And really, it should look. Obviously, it goes into the fact that it should look like is if you were applying for an external job. And so, you know, for those that are interested, at the end, my information will be here. Happy to send you um, this newsletter. So uh, I'm a sharer. So anybody that that wants this, uh, you know, wants to see it, uh, and you email me. I'll send it to you and have at it and do it your way. Um, and then finally, we ask questions, we answer questions about the internal uh, process, and um, we're also starting a brand ambassador campaign. Um, when I say, let me back up, it's, we don't want to call it a brand ambassador. We want to call it the AHA Life Ambassador uh, Campaign to get more internal movement uh, towards our AHA, the AHA Life, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn uh, uh, accounts. And obviously the more you can grow those internally, the more they share with their networks, the more candidates you have coming in. So um, we, we do have an FAQ uh, that uh, we, they directly link into our, uh, through our internal portal of our ATS as well as a brand ambassador uh, FAQ as well. And actually, I kind of show you here. So as you can see, this is kind of what it looks like. You can see the different highlighted career opportunities. Um, the search all open positions takes them to the uh, internal portal. Um, and then um, these are just um, these are two events that, uh, that are happening here. And then this is Ask the Career Coach. Sorry, I covered up covered up as the career coach, which is right above that. Um, and then they can email questions to the careers at heart.org. And then these are the FAQs here, the questions about our internal hiring process and ready to become an AHA. We, we changed that to AHA Life Ambassador. And then we have them share our posts. Uh, and these are tagged with the AHA Life. So just a, an overview of the type of newsletter and communications. And the more you get out, more communications you get out about your opportunities and the more you share them, the more people feel like are, they're part of this internal alert community and that they'll want to be active. They're going to, they'll be excited to read uh, the email when it comes up. And uh, so you don't want to, um, I think doing this actually helps everybody push information. The more information you push out, the better off you're going to uh, going to be. So when we measure the success um, and the metrics that we'll start to review, obviously you're going to look at total turnover. In our case, we're going to look at fundraiser turnover. Um, we're going to look at our employee engagement percentage, so how much are they responding to surveys um, when they go out. Talent readiness per succession, um, really looking at your succession plans and trying to figure out the amount of people that are ready out of the total population. Um, internals versus uh, external fills. So uh, you know, over the three years you saw the last slide was at 36%, but um, on average, uh, you know, it's 25 to 28% uh, each year. Um, but I did a bigger metric looking at all three years. And then you want to look at the percent of internals promoted versus uh, internals who make lateral moves. Lateral moves are just as important in a person's growth as a promotion is. And granted, it may be the same money. Uh, it may be a little bit more money. But we try to encourage people to apply for all positions, not looking at the money, looking at the bigger amount of money. We don't encourage people to apply if it's all about the money for them. We want people to apply because they're ready to grow their own skills and they're ready to move into the organization. So down the road, we're going to look at quality of hire and we're going to look at mentoring effectiveness. So the mentoring effectiveness really is when we have, because we do have an internal uh, mentoring program, you know, what are we, um, how effective is that? Do we see movement uh, in the people that are going through this mentorship program um, versus those that have chosen not to? So you, 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 you already have a, a good test group out there. We're in our second year, and after this year, we're going to start measuring 
the effectiveness to see how many people that were in the mentoring program actually received um, a uh, uh, received a promotion or were laterally transferred. So, you know, I think you know when you're when you're calculating the ROI uh, for the broader knowledge, you know, you need to look at you know who the knowledge uh, you know, really, who the knowledge sources are in your company, right? What's the, uh, you know, what's what's the reality of, um, you know, of uh, of everything? So, you know, when you look through the bumps in the plan, you know, everybody says, all right, we're going to go smooth sailing, but in reality, it looks like this. I mean, you have pitfalls, and so, you know, some of the bumps that we've experienced really have led to some of the programs like succession planning, like the internal newsletter. Um, for me, um, what's been very, very important is the internal candidate experience. And, um, you know, one of the things that we're starting to measure this year is um, internal candidate satisfaction. When we apply for the candidate experience award each year, which is offered uh, through the talent board, um, we are, uh, you know, we're asking internal candidates about their experience as well. And we find that sometimes the internal process is a little more rough, is more like the bottom than for the external candidates, which is kind of hard to believe. You would think it'd be smooth sailing. But we run into sometimes hiring managers not following back up with candidates, um, uh, hiring managers you know, forgetting about showing up to internal interviews. Yes, that's happened. Um, and you go, wow, how can that happen? Well, that's really up to us to make sure that it doesn't happen and what could then we start looking internally to say, well what could we have done better? Right? So um we we have had our, our share of lumps, but we've really tried to smooth out those lumps and it's gonna come more through measurement than, than anything else. Hey Michael, so, we have another question. Yeah. Um I think they're referencing a previous slide though, but they asked how you're going to measure effectiveness. Effectiveness of what? Uh, it says how they're going to measure effective, effectiveness. Previous slide. Um, I can get more information. Con continue, and I'll, I'll ask. Yeah, I mean, I can go. I mean, I can go back. Um, if the person would just tell me what you know, what they're what they're looking. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, some of the things to look at. You know, who are the knowledge sources in your company? Who needs that knowledge? You know, some of the things that we'll look at are what are the three most common competencies people want to improve on. Um, you know, are there trends or common, you know, commonalities among your knowledge sources? They said uh, location? under mentoring effectiveness, like how do you measure that? Sure. So we will. Um, so uh, I think I mentioned what we'll do is we'll look at um, the people that were in the mentoring uh, program. Uh, we will. We do survey them. Uh, but then I will also run a report out of my ATS to see um, if they're growing and then circling back with them who are hired, All right? So looking at my my hires and uh, speaking with those who were in the mentoring program that were hired and saying, hey, you know, did your mentor, you know, help you get there um, in creating a, a scalable um, either survey or having a phone conversation, which I think is easier because you can gain more information out of it to find out, hey, was this as a result? And really start creating that. Something we're still building, um, but uh, you know, really looking at who in that mentoring group was hired uh, and then speaking with them about how they got that job. What kind of skills did the mentor provide them? Uh, what kind of a career advice did they get so that they were successful in obtaining their job, so or their new role. So generally, you're just looking at the at the at the metrics and how they were. I think it really boils down to when it comes down to anything, especially in the recruiting world, it's all about um, how effective were your programs. Well, it was based on the hires. You know, how effective were your social you know your social sites? They're as good as the hires you get on. Uh, or that you yield from those sites. Sources of hire, what are the best, you know, the Monster Group, what are LinkedIn? Um, you know, in, indeed at this point, um, you look at the number of hires and the money you're investing in it. And for us, 
The only thing we're investing for the mentoring is on pe is people's times. Generally, it depends on the mentor, but I meet with my mentee uh, once a month for an hour. And uh, we go through what's going right, what's going wrong, what positions they have their eye on, and uh, and how I help them get to the next stage of their career. So you look at all those things, really when it boils down to hiring, and then having follow-up conversations and creating a rating system that says, hey, yeah, this is what's this is what this rating percentage would be considered effective, and that's something we we're, we're still building because, like I said, we're in the middle of our second year, so um, that's one of the things I want to look at after two years. Where are we uh, then and now? I hope that answers the question. Sure. It did. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, to me. I like I like the quote that's still left, never let a stumble in the road be the end of your journey. Um, it's not always going to be perfect. You know, internal employees get missed. Um, hopefully your ATS systems have an asterisk or a star or at least tagged with the word internal or some nomenclature to say, hey, I'm an internal employee. Having the managers be transparent with the candidates that they speak with, really not saying, well, it just wasn't a good fit. We found another internal who was a better fit. Well, okay, if I'm that employee, how do I, you know, how do I feel? And so you coach the managers, and I had to do this recently, right? I had to sit the manager down and just say, hey, look, you know, put yourself in their shoes. How would you feel if you were told you weren't a fit? What does that mean? Um, be, be detailed with them. Um, you know, you may, you know, no one wants to hear the tough love part about it, but if they didn't interview well, tell them that they didn't interview well, and here's where you didn't interview well, and here's where you can improve on. If they're lacking specific skills, then focus on the, those skills to what they need to go get and where they can where they can find these skills and who they can talk to inside or outside the organization um, to, to build those skills so the next time the position opens, they're ready. Interview etiquette, show, you know, having hiring managers showing up on time, even the recruiters making the phone calls on time. And continuous communication, um, which, you know, in our recruiting lives, it's hard to balance communication and letting everybody know. So we try to touch base um, with our internal employees. Uh, when we have an update with them, if we find that it generally goes more than a week long where they don't, where, where we haven't received anything, we're going to reach out to the manager by phone, not through an IM or an email, but by phone to say, hey, we need to get back to our internal employees. Where are we? Because they're looking for an update. We get that update and then we call the employee, not email the employee or not IM the employee, but phone call. Um, there are things still such as phones and we and we let them know. And I think we could, all, we, I know the recruiters, my team and the recruiters across the country, it's not always there and just because we get bogged down and having to communicate with externals or we're working on sourcing or we're processing some type of paperwork. So. You always do want to keep communication top of mind. Uh, that's a that's probably a no-brainer. Um, so how we smoothed it out. So all employees are required to apply for internal postings through our internal careers portal. We've coached hiring managers on the benefits of honesty, etiquette, and providing advice uh, to to those internal people who are applying. And we're also developing and have developed touch points throughout the recruiting process to say whether they're internal, no matter if they're internal or external. You need to touch them at least once a week and just let them know. Even though it's nothing, there's no update. Hey, we're still waiting to hear back from the hiring manager. They're still finishing up interviews. Whatever you know to be true, don't BS. Whatever that you know to be true, tell them. Just touch them. It'll take you two minutes to have that phone call. And sometimes they may say, well, when do you expect it? If you know when to expect it, then tell them. If you don't know, say, I really just don't know, uh, but I will do everything I can to find something out. Let's touch base and give them a date and you touch base with them. Hey, Michael, another question. Yep. Um, they say, is your internal career support all your ATS? I'm sorry, about, about I don't understand They're asking the question. If, if your internal career portal is, does it serve Part as of your our ATS? Yeah. Is that what the question is? Yeah, it is a part of our ATS. We have an internal portal and an external portal that are tied to Silk Road. So for anybody that's on Silk Road knows that you have that. But I think most ATS systems today do have an internal and external portal. I haven't heard different. 
Perfect. All right. So where are we going? Um, so one of the things that we're having our candidates do is one of the things Workday does is we're having our, candidate, our internal employees upload skill section of their LinkedIn profile so we can go and source our own HCM for internal candidates that have specific skill sets in a particular position that we recently opened. Um, we're continuing to build on our succession plan and our performance management uh, training. Um, we're using tools in the HCM to help us get where we need to go. Um, we have an internal career development day, uh, as I mentioned, that we're doing for our uh, internal employees. Uh, what we're looking to do after that, and this is just a pilot at our national office, is doing throughout the country, doing virtual internal career fairs um, throughout the country for all affiliates or all regional offices. And then looking at opportunity to do text alerts to internals, um, just as an external would receive a job alert about a position, doing the same solely focused on internals to give them access into our internal portal. So we're looking at that for next fiscal year. So um, that is my presentation in a, in a nutshell. And um, you know, certainly uh, any additional questions, um, you know, here's, this is my information here. And feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, if you want to connect with me on Twitter, or uh, Twitter is, is going to be at Super Recruiter. Um, um, and then LinkedIn, you can find me, obviously, Michael Goldberg, um, though there are a lot. It's, it's, I think it's the Dallas Michael Goldberg is my LinkedIn, uh, or Dallas Michael Goldberg is my, is my URL uh, for LinkedIn. But also on Insta, also uh, on all the major ones. So those are my two phone numbers. The top one is my, um, is my office phone. The bottom is my mobile phone. Feel free to call me with any questions. At any time, happy to answer them for you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for being on our web webinar today. And thanks to Rollpoint again for sponsoring us. Uh, if you guys have any other questions, uh, feel free to email Michael right there at his email address. And we'll be sending the presentation out within 48 hours of this broadcast. And you'll also get a copy of the slides. Uh, yeah, if you have any other questions, um, go for it. Uh, yeah, and we will talk to you guys later. Thanks again, Michael. I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, everybody.